The other day, that umbrella guy tweeted out that he had been unsubscribed from my channel without his knowledge or consent. Please check to make sure that you're still subscribed, and if you haven't subscribed, please do so. We need you to join us in our fight to save pop culture. Thank you, enjoy this video, and prepare. Rise of Skywalker is only a few days away. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker premiered just a few hours ago. The premiere was a milestone over 40 years in the making, for this was Episode 9, the conclusion of the Star Wars saga. It was a star-studded gala, a huge celebration of Star Wars in keeping with the importance of the moment. Other than the cast and key crew members, the guests included such luminaries as Harrison Ford, Amy Adams, Elizabeth Banks, Tom Bergeron, Ahmed Best, Zoe Deschanel, Elizabeth Shue, Steven Spielberg, Jean Favreau, Dave Filoni, Damon Lindelof, Spike Lee, John Kasdan, Jake Kasdan, Lawrence Kasdan, the list goes on and on. But fans of Star Wars will no doubt have noticed that one significant name was missing from that list. George Lucas. That's right. The man who created Star Wars was not present at this milestone in the history of Star Wars. The man who was turned down by every major studio in Hollywood. The man who wrote draft after draft for years trying to perfect his vision of that galaxy far, far away. Who sweated blood and bullets to give his vision its start was not present for its end. George Lucas was not invited to the premiere of Rise of Skywalker. Disney declined to invite the creator of Star Wars to the last movie in the Star Wars saga. This display of disrespect towards George Lucas is truly sickening. An intolerable sight that should make every Star Wars fan livid. And it is far from Disney's first betrayal of George Lucas. Bob Iger himself reported in his memoir, The Ride of a Lifetime, that he had purchased George Lucas's treatments for the sequel trilogy, in essence leading Lucas to believe that Disney would be using them. Iger claims that, while he hadn't actually lied to Lucas, quote, We made clear in the purchase agreement that we would not be contractually obligated to adhere to the plot lines he laid out, unquote. In the end, Disney alienated George Lucas when George was finally shown the outline for The Force Awakens. Quote, George immediately got upset as they began to describe the plot, and it dawned on him that we weren't using one of the stories he submitted during the negotiations. George knew we weren't contractually bound to anything, but he thought that our buying the story treatments was a tacit promise that we'd follow them, wrote Iger and he was disappointed that his story was being discarded. I'd been so careful since our first conversation not to mislead him in any way, and I didn't think I had now, but I could have handled it better. Iger then concludes, George felt betrayed, and while this whole process would never have been easy for him, we'd gotten him off to an unnecessarily rocky start. Reportedly, when Lucas saw the finished movie, he quote, didn't hide his disappointment. Lucas felt betrayed by Iger in Disney. That much is clear. And yet, the betrayal by Iger occurred many years ago. And in the time since, Lucas has gamely been a good sport. Attending official Disney Star Wars functions, getting his picture taken with Mickey Mouse while holding a lightsaber, appearing at the opening of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, a Star Wars theme park almost entirely free of Star Wars. Lucas had bitten the bullet, and betrayal or not, he had taken one for the team, and cooperated with Disney's efforts to promote their Star Wars brand. Disney wanted George Lucas at those Star Wars events because his presence lent them an air of authority. So what changed between Iger's initial betrayal and George Lucas being shunned at the premiere? of Episode 9, one of my sources was adamant that George Lucas had been recruited to save Rise of Skywalker. My source was not only adamant, 
but entirely motivated by a desire to get word out to the world that the George Lucas cut not only existed, but saved. Episode 9. Featuring over 30 minutes of new footage and the inclusion of a secret Skywalker, this George Lucas cut was, according to my source, not merely adequate, but excellent. Lucas himself personally conceived of a way to fix Rise of Skywalker and was intimately involved with producing this cut. According to this particular rumor, this cut of the film scored the highest of any of the cuts shown to test audiences with an overall score of 88. My source was hopeful that this would be the version that fans would see. Judging from the leaks coming out of advanced screenings, including last night's premiere, they did not select the George Lucas cut. Despite it being the best of between 5 and 12 different cuts of the film, allegedly, the final cut decision belonged to Kathleen Kennedy. And for whatever reason she went with, according to my source, a hybrid of the J.J. Abrams cut and the Bob Iger cut. And so, according to this rumor, once again, George Lucas' contribution to Star Wars was discarded. Willfully discarded. Once again, Disney, according to my source, ignored George Lucas, trashed not only his outlines for the sequel, but also his own personal ending for the saga. Even with that invitation, I doubt George Lucas would have wanted to be there to witness the final butchering of his vision, the final trashing of his galaxy far, far away. It's not an easy thing to watch your child be abused. Make no mistake, Rise of Skywalker in the simple act of bringing Palpatine back from the dead is a horrific deconstruction and repudiation of the original Star Wars trilogy. If Palpatine survived the Death Star explosion, then that means Vader's sacrifice was for nothing. That means Luke's heroics amounted to little more than bravado. That means all that the Rebellion went through was merely a delaying action, and the true hero of the entire saga is Rey. Rey defeats Palpatine where Vader couldn't, where Luke couldn't, where Yoda couldn't, where Mace Windu couldn't, where all the Jedi Council couldn't. Rey towers above them all and manages, along with her boyfriend Kylo, to do what could not be done by all the other Jedi. Indeed. My source tells me, and I now have some confirmation of this, at one point Palpatine tells Rey, I am all the Sith. To which Rey replies, I am all the Jedi. I am all the Jedi, says Rey. And she is. During the battle at the end, all the Force ghosts rally to her cause, spurring her on to defeat Palpatine, though not helping her directly because even though now we know Force ghosts can shoot lightning, she's the bestest ever, and so they just let her fight alone and beat Palpatine alone. Thus, the Disney sequel trilogy not only ignores George Lucas's explicit written wishes for how the saga should end, but actually reaches back in time and smashes his work to pieces degrading and destroying the original trilogy by peddling the fan-fictional lie that Palpatine survived at the end of Return of the Jedi. And Palpatine not only survived, but triumphed. Because Rey is his granddaughter, and at the end, she assumes the name Skywalker. And thus, a Palpatine has supplanted the Skywalker clan and defeated them utterly. And so I ask you, can we blame Lucas for not wanting to watch his dream get murdered? We owe George Lucas, all of us, some of the best moments of our childhoods. This man changed our lives, showed us worlds we never could have imagined ourselves, transported a lot of lonely, misunderstood geeks to a galaxy far, far away. That is a debt that we can never repay. To see George Lucas treated this way hurts my soul. I can't imagine what it must be like 
to be betrayed by your hand-picked successor, misled by Disney, possibly even, if the rumors are true, recruited to help them with Rise of Skywalker, only to have your work discarded yet again. And we wonder why he wasn't invited to that premiere. Maybe his silence while watching his child be abused up there on that screen would have drowned out all the explosions and deafened the Disney hordes. Maybe they just couldn't bear to look him in the eye. All I know is, his absence is monstrous. A silent repudiation of Rise of Skywalker and a stinging rebuke to the people who made it. I suppose a lot of people will succumb to the desire to see this thing for themselves. You know my stance. Without respect, we reject. Disney has lied about us for years, being racists, being sexists, being trolls, being wrong about the fact that The Last Jedi stinks to high heaven. The Last Jedi was Disney's failure, not ours. But Disney has preferred to blame you. And if you return to the theater with your wallet open, you will be like a battered spouse returning home for more abuse after being slapped and beaten by your spouse. But even if you don't care about the years of abuse Disney has heaped on fans, gaslighting us as racists and sexists just because we hated The Last Jedi, even if that means nothing to you, I ask you merely this. If Rise of Skywalker isn't good enough for George Lucas, why should we go?